everyone, I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Arts in the City. With freezing temperatures and record snowfalls, our climate is something a lot of us are thinking about. It is also the inspiration for a compelling new exhibition here at Lehman College Art Gallery. We'll check out more of what's on display a bit later in the show, but first, a story that's been making headlines, Broadway understudies in the spotlight. When COVID outbreaks hit, sending cast members into quarantine, understudies across the city stepped into center stage. Our Patrick Pacheco, host of All the Moving Parts, speaks with one of these unsung heroes of the theater district. Well, hello, Cameron. Hi. It is so nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. And I'm so looking forward to our discussion Me about too. the understudy. What is an understudy? An understudy is a person in the ensemble of a cast who covers or understudies one of the leading actors. What are your obligations uh, when you come through the stage door? That's the tricky part, is every day you have to be prepared just in case. So uh, even if there are no planned outs, you know, even if someone doesn't have a personal day or uh, you don't think they're sick or any of that, you have to be ready to go on at any time. Obviously, when another study goes on, there is a slip of paper in the <laughs> yeah. playbills yep. or there's an announcement by the stage manager. Yeah. The role, the role of Billy Bendix, yeah. usually played, yeah. will be now played by you. Yeah, no pressure. And, uh, <laughs> how do you feel when you hear the stage manager's announcement? <laughs> That's a great question because we always joke. I mean, uh, if you cover someone like Kelly O'Hara, obviously people are excited to see Kelly O'Hara, which I totally understand. And when a brunette comes out instead of a blonde. But, uh, you know, I try to just not even think about it. And my job is to go out there and be there with the rest of my cast and hopefully do a good enough job that they don't, we get into the groove of things and they don't even realize that it's different. And do you ever sense that you've won over the audience, whatever their yeah. resistance may be at the beginning? I actually have a great story about yes, that. Yes, please. Um, I was on for Kelly and I had, I had done it a few times at this point, I was pretty comfortable. And towards the end of the show, she sings this very sad duet with Matthew Broderick and she's leaving town. And the way it's set up is she's actually sitting on a little, um, uh, almost like a plank above the orchestra pit. She's sitting there with her backpack and she's singing out into the audience and she sings the last note and it goes dark and the people applaud and you have to climb down a little ladder uh -huh. into the orchestra pit. And a lady leaned over to me during the applause and said, you're doing a great job. <laughs> and I said, thank you. <laughs> I go down the ladder and, get, and finish the show. So that felt pretty good. <laughs> that does feel good. Yeah, you know, have. you feel it. What are some of the most hair-raising experiences you've had as an understudy? The first or second time I ever went on for Kelly at Nice Work If You Can Get It, she starts singing Someone to Watch Over Me. Someone to watch over me. So no pressure, just a super iconic <laughs> song that everyone knows that normally Kelly O'Hara sings. And she's a bootlegger in the show. And one of her friends runs out with a gun hands her a gun, she cocks the gun and <laughs> continues to sing the song, it's very funny. And my friend, Chris Sullivan, handed the gun to me, said the line, and the gun fell into two pieces. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> that's actually one of those times where I felt like the audience sort of like had my back uh -huh. after that. They were like, okay, this is poor kids out there trying to sing a song and you know, her prop rope. But it, it, you know, you make it work and you keep going. And the most rewarding aspect of what you do it feels incredible to do that on a stage, to go out there and step into someone else's shoes for an evening or two and to sing those songs and and transform into a different character that you don't get to play. You know, it's why we become actors. It's really rewarding. Now more from behind the curtain, lost plays that are found again. So can they become great plays? New York's Mint Theatre Company thinks so, and our Donna Hanover agrees. The Mint Theatre Company in New York produces lost or neglected plays. Its artistic director since 1995 is Jonathan Bank. The motto of the Mint Theatre Company is lost plays found here. There was the Lillian Hellman play they put up in 2018. Lillian Hellman, of course, very famous for a number of plays, but Days to Come is, is a play from early in her career that flopped 
and I think undeservedly so. Sometimes they do plays by writers who are actually famous as novelists, like Ernest Hemingway. We did the premiere of Ernest Hemingway's The Fifth Column in 2008. He wrote one play. Hemingway's version of The Fifth Column had never been done. That's correct, it had never been done. And we made a recording of that and shared it with scholars across the world. And delightfully uh, to his son, Patrick Hemingway, who came to see it and loved it. The Mint has also done plays by A.A. A. Milne. Before Winnie the Pooh, he was a really famous, successful playwright. He had four plays running simultaneously on Broadway in 1921-22. And Winnie the Pooh ruined his playwriting career. <laughs> and you brought it back? It's a great play, Mr. Pym Passes By is the first one we did. The Mint's website presents 12 black playwrights whose works have been neglected, and readings are planned for some of those plays later this year. Often the Mint Theater shows are staged in a 99-seat theater here in the West 42nd Street Theater Row Building. But sometimes they go for a larger house as for their first show back after the pandemic. That's The Daughter-in-Law by D.H. Lawrence, which opened recently at City Center Stage 2. He never saw it published, he never saw it produced. It was a typescript in a drawer. Shows that have physical conflict get added rehearsal for safety. And for all plays, the Mint does something special. For years, they've had their shows professionally shot and edited. So during the pandemic, they had videos of wonderful productions to stream online when folks couldn't gather in theaters. People were invited to pay, but if money was tight, you invited them to watch for free. It was a real pleasure to give the work away and to pay the artist. And a lot of that was made possible through the federal programs. The Paycheck Protection Program certainly helped us to pay the salaries. Well-known actors are excited to be part of the Mint's work, like in 2017 when Max von Essen, known as a great singer and a Tony nominee for the Broadway musical An American in Paris, acted in Yours Unfaithfully by Miles Mallison, written back in 1935. Max von Essen actually made his, his you know, legit uh, debut. It was his first straight play, but I read in interviews that he was a little scared, but he did a fantastic job. Irish playwright Teresa Devey, who wrote in the 1930s, has been highlighted by The Mint. The Mint has published two anthologies of Devey's work and four anthologies of other playwrights they've produced, because once they bring a play back, they want to keep it from getting lost again. There is a sense in the world that cream always rises to the top. It doesn't. It takes a lot of pushing. And some plays and playwrights don't get that pushing. And that's where we come in. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City. We are celebrating love this month with some popular romance movies. Neil Rosen has suggestions for critically acclaimed films, perfect for cuddling up with your Valentine or just some popcorn. If you're in the mood for a romantic movie for Valentine's Day, or any day for that matter, there's many classic Academy Award winning or nominated films that fit the bill. Here's a look at a few. He's looking at you, kid. Here's looking at one of the greatest screen romances in movie history, Casablanca. Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman light up the screen in this classic World War II love story from 1942 that won three Oscars, including a well-deserved statuette for Best Picture. 1997's Titanic won a whopping 11 Oscars, including Best Picture. Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio heat up the screen as two people from different social classes who fall for each other on board the ill-fated maiden voyage of that infamous luxury liner. 1934's It Happened One Night had the honor of being the first film to win a clean sweep of the top five major Oscar categories. This much-heralded Frank Capra romantic comedy starred Clark Gable as a roguish reporter and Claudette Colbert as a runaway heiress who fall in love when a bus leaves them stranded in the middle of nowhere. Tonight, tonight, 
Want to see the great yet tragic romance of Tony and Maria in West Side Story? Well, take your pick. You can go with the original movie from 1961, which won 10 Oscars, including Best Picture, as well as a win for Rita Moreno. Or take a look at Steven Spielberg's awesome new remake, which also features Moreno and has a great chance of bringing home some Oscar gold, too. Meryl Streep holds the record for the most Academy Award nominations of anyone in Oscar history, 21. And one of those was her playing an Italian war bride living in Iowa who falls for Clint Eastwood, a photographer on assignment there in the bridges of Madison County. Together, they spend four unforgettable days in this most moving of love stories. I have no idea what your situation is, but I feel like we have some kind of uh, connection, right? Yeah, me too. Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy starred in the Oscar-nominated trilogy Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, and Before Midnight. But easily the most romantic of the three is the first one, where they're two strangers who meet on a European train and unexpectedly hop off together in Vienna. As they explore the city over the course of one brief day, they fall madly and uncontrollably in love. Waiter, there is too much pepper on my paprikash. Waiter, there is too much pepper. pepper. On my paprikash. On my paprikash. But I would be proud to partake of your pecan pie. <laughs> oh, no. One of my favorite romantic comedies of all time is When Harry Met Sally. As Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan play a couple who are perfectly made for each other, but they just don't know it yet. The late great screenwriter Nora Ephron was nominated for an Oscar for her brilliant work here. In 1990, Ghost featured a love story between Demi Moore and her recently deceased husband played by Patrick Swayze who comes from the great beyond to warn her of impending danger. Let's put it this way. You'll never look at clay on a potter's wheel the same way again with the heat that these two actors generate. The Humphrey Bogart classic Sabrina is a delightful Oscar-winning Billy Wilder romance from 1954, as Bogie and William Holden both vie for the affections of Audrey Hepburn. Brooklyn was my favorite movie back in 2015, and it was nominated for three Oscars, including Best Picture, and Best Actress, Saoirse Ronan. It's about an Irish immigrant who comes to New York in the 1950s and has to decide between her first love, a nice young Italian man from Brooklyn, or live a more secure life in her native country with another guy who also loves her deeply. It's a wonderful romantic film that goes straight to your heart. I have a life halfway across the sea. Your life here could be just as good. Happy romantic movie watching, everyone. For Arts in the City, I'm Neil Rosen. Of course, love isn't just for Hollywood fairy tales. It is all around us. Our photographer, Laura Fuchs, took to the streets and found plenty to swoon over. As we observe Black History Month, we meet a student who uses archival footage and fashion to explore our city's history and the fight for racial equality. Eddie Bailey has more. Sola Alasunde is the son of Nigerian immigrants, whose love for history was fostered by spending time with his father, listening to him reminisce on New York City's past. He used to talk to me about um, like his first experiences in New York City. When we used to <laughs> ride around places in Manhattan, he'd be like, wow, this place looks so different. I remember when I first came here, it used to be horrible, run down. There used to be like so much crime, just talking about how bad the city became. And that's how I ended up getting really, really, really into history. Those conversations with his father were instrumental in him turning his interest for history from a hobby into a passion. 
He now uses Twitter as a way to tell pieces of New York history through sharing archival images and videos that connect people with the city's past. And then Sola posted an archival video from a 1976 episode of the Bill Moyers Journal titled Rosedale, The Way It Is. And then I posted one clip, some black kids having a racist encounter with some white kids. And that went viral, very viral. White people start saying, get out of here, niggas. You know, get out of my neighborhood. Don't come to this neighborhood. And then they start punch hitting on her. Yeah, I was just glad that there's finally proof. Like, there's something that we can actually see, and it's undeniable. The Rosedale clip caught the attention of the New York Times. And then they decided to reach out and do an article on him. They shot me like around my house and the article was made. I didn't expect it to be like this whole like two page thing in the Sunday paper, but that's I'm very flattered. And I mean, it feels surreal. The New York Times also couldn't help but to notice his eclectic New York swag. Black New York, that's like what I care about in terms of style. Like style here was like a big thing growing up. And then when I started researching style, like Black New York style through the years, I kind of like just was taken from different places, you know, the Kangol, the Wallabies, the permanent press pants. Sola says that in general, when people come to visit his Twitter page, he wants them to learn something new about New York. I don't want people necessarily to see my stuff and feel as if I'm indoctrinating people because I'm not really doing that. Your stance on certain solutions is gonna change if you know the history that I know. And if you don't, cool. As long as you know what I know, that's fine with me. A young man who was always finding new ways to curate history, Sola is currently developing a yearbook about black New York history through the lens of the New York City public school system. Until then, you can catch him on Twitter at Drink Sola Pop. I'm Eddie Bailey for Arts in the City. A heartbreaking loss for the arts world, groundbreaking actor Sidney Poitier died in January. He was 94. Pepita Sandwich is an author, illustrator, and artist with a distinct style. She explains her inspiration spans thousands of miles, from her home in Argentina to right here in New York. Drawing has always helped me feel better and express my feelings through comics and through drawings, and that is very, very therapeutic. My name is Pepita Sandwich. I'm a cartoonist and illustrator from Buenos Aires, Argentina and I'm living in Brooklyn. I make comics, I make illustrations, I make visual essays, and my work talks about women. I like to talk about nostalgia, and a lot of my work has to do with growing up in the 90s and being a girl during that time. I have two published books. My first book is called Survival Diaries, and it was published in 2016. And my second book, it's called Women Move Mountains. Las Mujeres Mueven Montañas. And it's a book that talks about 14 different women explorers that had different adventures during different times in history. I grab those stories and I turn them into comics, and then each one has their different styles because of the different adventures they did and they went through. I first moved to New York in 2019 to work in um, 
grew and, and have a different perspective from my identity. I think that looking at your identity from uh, a different point of view, when you move to a different city, you live in a different country and you, you see yourself better at the distance. Growing up, I felt New York was like this wonderful place because of all the movies I watched about New York. But when you get here, you realize that it's very tough also. And I started doing more autobio comics. For example, my series, Pepita in the City. I started them trying to really convey what it feels to move to a big city like New York with a lot of people and how all the like hustle to get work and get an apartment and the different things you have to do to survive in the everyday life in New York. Before coming here, I didn't think a lot about being Latina just because I was living in Latin America. But when I came here, I was able to understand more deeply what it means to be Latina and how the Latin American experience is portrayed in media here and I wanted to understand and to put a light on more diverse stories. We have different stories. Latin America is a very rich continent with different cultures. I feel inspired by a lot of women when I do my work. I also feel inspired by a lot of women artists. And one of the cartoonists that I felt very inspired for at the beginning of my career was Maitena. She's a female cartoonist from Argentina, and she was very popular and big in the 90s. And I read her while I was growing up, and I feel like seeing a woman in a big newspaper doing a comic strip inspired me to see and to know that I could do that too growing up. I feel like representation is very important. Every time you see someone like you doing something that you never saw before, you feel you can do that too. If puppy love is your thing, and it's certainly mine, we've got a book you might want to pick up. It's called Pup Culture, and it's all about best friends. Like, look at this face. She look, look at my face. I'm so cute. Puppy love in its truest form. Victoria Lily Schaefer is fiercely devoted to dogs and not just the three she's adopted herself. As an advocate for animal rescue and author of the book, Pup Culture, she doesn't miss a moment when it comes to convincing others. In fact, she started as a kid. I did tons of research. I learned about rescue and I really made a case to my parents of why we should rescue. These are dogs in need. They came from dumpsters off the street. Victoria is the daughter of late night musical legend Paul Schaefer and her parents did not start out as dog people. But then came Riley and Jake, now passed away after happy lives in their forever home. They were completely a part of our family. We sat down with Victoria while she visited her family over the holidays, and family includes her three dogs, who traveled with her from the West Coast. So going in birth order, the first was Rue. Mm -hmm. She is a Boston Terrier Chihuahua, and she's almost 10. The queen. She's the queen. Then we have Echo. He just turned nine. Echo is very afraid of feet, probably because he was kicked before he was rescued. And then our latest, this is Alfie, say hello. And he absolutely adores his siblings. He's like a Mexico street dog. And he has this cleft paw, which he's showing off so perfectly. Yeah. We don't know what his future holds. We don't know if he will uh, need to get that leg amputated, if it starts to cause him pain. Right now, he doesn't really like it to be touched too much, <laughs> but um, he, he seems to be doing fine and he really doesn't know the difference. Do you see yourselves here? Victoria's book featuring Rue, Echo, and Alfie on the cover explores the relationships between people and dogs. It offers tips on adopting, fostering, and caring for them, including money-saving ideas, home recipes, and even some celebrities. David Letterman wrote about his dog, Bob, that he found in a bar. Glenn Close wrote about a dog that just showed up in her trailer, kind of chose her. Tony Bennett did an original sketch of his dog for my book, which still, like I pinched myself that he, did, he went through that trouble. 
And if your dog helped you through COVID lockdowns like our rescue Hudson did, wait until you hear about Victoria's experience fostering dozens of puppies during the pandemic. I did have a hundred dogs and puppies come through my house since the pandemic began. I was in there bottle feeding puppies, cleaning up messes, flea baths and deworming and trimming nails, all of that stuff. It was just an amazing experience. It put a positive twist on the pandemic for me. There you go, buddy. Victoria has now founded her own rescue dedicated to saving dogs and educating others about adoption. And though there is certainly some heartbreak, there's also great reward. The best part is when those adopters come back like a year later and they're ready for their second dog because the first one just absolutely transforms their life. That is the best feeling when I'm like, I got you. Like, you're on the rescue bandwagon now. Welcome to the team. <laughs> that is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us. A quick reminder to check us out on social media. We would love to hear from you. I'm Carol Ann Rudell. See you next time on Arts in the City.